You know, apparently it's not uncommon for people to walk over 160,000 kilometers in their lifetime. That's a whole lot of walking, a whole lot of adventures, and sometimes a lot of discomfort if you're someone who has some foot problems. We're going to dive in and talk about some of the foot problems and solutions today with Emily Soper. She's a certified pedorthist with a degree in kinesiology. She's also the owner of Nexus Orthotics in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Emily, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So what are some of the more common type of foot problems that people are experiencing right now? Yeah, some of the most common ones that I see here in the office are probably bunions, hammer toes, uh, plantar fasciitis, Morton's neuroma, to name a few. But yeah, it's pretty common that those four pop up weekly. You know, as a matter of fact, I experienced a little bit of the hammer toe situation myself because I grew so fast, my feet grow so big when I was a kid, my parents couldn't keep up with the new shoes and the toes don't exactly sit flat, they're a little bit curled here. So you see a lot more of that with kids today? Uh, yeah, I do see a lot with that. I mean, it's hard for parents to keep up with how fast the kids grow and um, kids sometimes don't always tell you and it's hard to buy a shoe beginning of the year and then have to replace it again in December. So especially with today's costs, um, I do see it more often than not. But again, there's a hereditary factor in some cases where the second toe is longer. And then in that case, over time, it definitely claws back out of the so way. Would you give, what advice would you give to parents maybe buy more sandals <laughs> for the kids? <laughs> yeah, no, not so much. It depends on the kid too, but you always want to make sure that you're getting a thumb, a thumb space from the end of their longest toe to the end of the shoe when buying shoes at the store, for sure. What are some of the causes, Emily, of a lot of the foot issues we're seeing today? And are they even preventable? Yeah, a lot of the causes I would say are probably shoes. That's probably the number one. Um, a lot of the shoes that we buy are not the greatest um, and people actually don't really know what to buy for what specific activities they're doing, as well as it can be even job related, like um, working on concrete all day can, can wear and tear on the body and even dress shoes for sure if you have to dress up more for work as well. So I guess walking on the concrete all day is not very helpful, I guess, for a lot of your foot and back issues? I guess you could walk through Costco and ask some of those employees working there and they probably are a little grumpy and tired from standing on concrete all day. Yeah, it is. Our bodies are not designed to walk on concrete, so it definitely plays a big factor in pain for sure. So how much does the foot really impact our backs if we have foot problems that relates to some of maybe the back issues that we have as well? Yes, it definitely can. So a lot of times if you're not walking, um, your gait's a little bit off, let's say you're wearing like, have you ever seen those kids wear Ugg boots and they're wearing them inward? Um, that excess strain where the shoe and the foot is rotating in can definitely strain all the way up to the back over time. So it does play a big factor in, in back pain for sure. How dangerous is it? I've seen a lot of times on social media, a lot of advertisements for footwear. You know, people like, hey, buy these shoes, you can buy, but you're not actually trying them on to see if it's a good proper fit. People are just buying it online. How dangerous is that? So when you get them, you try them on, it's like, you know, they're not very comfortable at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I even get advertisements on Facebook and uh, Google all the time, because obviously I'm looking at shoes on a regular basis. Um, it's, I've had some people who've had success. I've even bought shoes online before too, but generally I know the brand before I'm buying it and I already know what size I am. So um, it's a risk if they have a good uh, return policy, maybe you could try it out. But a lot of the stuff online is geared towards, let's get more cushion on your feet. You don't need cushion. Um, most of the time we need more structured shoes on concrete, which is the opposite to what people think. Really? So you need a lot more of that support? What about people that have flat feet? How can you really help them? The arch has really fallen. Yeah, flat feet. I mean, it just generally depends if you've had like flat feet your whole life. Some people with flat feet their whole life generally don't, sometimes don't have any pain, but um, there are some who definitely do. If you just think of it as a car, if you have low shock on your car or high, you generally feel those bumps along the way a little bit more. How common is plantar fasciitis? Maybe you can explain to our viewers exactly what it is. Yeah, so plantar fasciitis, it's, it's pretty common. I'm sure you've heard someone or know someone who's had it. You've heard that dreaded plantar fasciitis kind of kicking around. Um, so it just generally means plantar fascia, and then itis means inflammation in the foot. So it's just a pain in that plantar part of your foot. Um, so it can be caused by all kinds of things. I would say the 
the big one is a tight calf, actually. Um, your calf gets a little bit tight from sitting um, or standing on concrete without stretching. It can definitely impact your foot there, for sure. So what are some of the symptoms we should really look out for? So some of the symptoms would be that first startup pain in the morning, those first few steps when you get out of bed. So let's say your heel or your arch is hurting when you wake up and you have to go to the bathroom and then it eases off after those 10 steps. Um, a nice stabbing pain in the heel is a good one or in the inside of the um, heel as well. Also, sometimes people explain that it feels like you're taking a rubber band and stretching it across your arch uh, during the day. So it can increase the more you walk on those first few steps for sure when you sit down like after lunch or dinner and get back up. Can orthotic insoles actually help to treat plantar fasciitis? How do they work? Yeah, so they definitely can help for sure. So what the orthotics are designed to do is they're designed to distribute plantar pressure throughout your foot so you don't have that high area of strain in the arch. So you add that orthotic in there and it takes some of that strain off every time you're walking. Um, it's kind of like the major science behind it, but a lot of times I'm kind of adding like shoe changes or um, some exercises to do at home as well to kind of get to the real cause of what's causing this foot problem. Are the orthotic insoles used maybe as a preventative measure as well? Yeah, you can definitely use it as a preventative measure. Let's say you have severely high arches and over time that that uh, high arch can lead to a lot of pressure in the ball of your foot um, and can cause amortose and, and Morton's neuroma and all kinds of issues up, up there or maybe even plantar fasciitis. So it can kind of prevent those types of things or even someone with a very flat foot um, can help prevent it from getting even more flat like uh, especially diabetic patients, actually. If you're a diabetic, you should look into more preventative maintenance for, for later on before you have any issues. Can you explain what night splints are and how they actually work? Yeah, night splints. Actually, I have one sitting back here right beside that knee brace. I'll grab it. So it looks like this. It's basically just stretches your foot while you're sleeping. Um, so if you have a hard time stretching as much as you need to during the, the day to get rid of plantar fasciitis, the night splint is a bulky option to kind of help. It's usually the last resort if we're really having a hard time um, getting that flexibility back in the calf. So Emily, how about potentially just doing foot stretches and using ice packs or maybe even seeing a reflexologist? Would that help? Yeah, that's always a good option. We always say stretching first because I, I think that orthotics aren't the be all and end all all the time. There's lots of things that you can do um, yourself before seeking help. Um, there's lots of good uh, Dr. Google things that will tell you that you can do some stretches at home um, and stretches is never a bad thing for sure. It's funny, I'm doing some foot stretches right now as we speak, pointing the toes back and forth back under the desk here that you can't see. So maybe that's a good thing as we're talking about it. Exactly. You can do that just while sitting at your desk. <laughs> Emily, can you explain what Achilles tendonitis is and what treatments are readily available? Yeah, so Achilles tendonitis, again, it's that itis word, inflammation in the Achilles tendon. So Achilles tendonitis. It's basically just... Um, and inflammation in the Achilles. So a lot of times, again, tight calf can cause that. Um, but most of the time I see just if you're either rolling out or rolling in, so that abnormal kind of walking that you're doing uh, can cause that excess strain and pull on the Achilles. Um, it's a fun one to treat. It can be a little bit finicky. Uh, sometimes it can take a while to get rid of it, but it is interesting once you do get it right that it kind of just smartens up and goes back to normal. Now you talk about proper footwear and the structure of a shoe being inclusive in the uh, proper footwear. What does that actually look like? Yeah, so I wish I had a shoe for an example for you today, but um, so soft and squishy things, like generally if you can take the shoe and rotate it and squish it into a ball, I would say uh, don't buy that for any long distance walking for sure. Um, you want a strong heel counter, so meaning that the back of the heel is stiff. Um, so when you have those ones where you can just slide in, that has zero control around the ankle. Um, so again, it will allow your foot to rotate in or out, depending on what you're doing. Um, and then wide base of support. So I'm sure you've seen like high heels or like very narrow shoes on the base. That's just generally not supporting your foot 
at all. And your arch can kind of hang off the side and, and lead to more um, pressure in that area. And then as well, size. So size makes the biggest difference. So if you have too tight a shoes or you're wearing those pointed shoes, generally over time, um, your foot will just kind of go to that way. So you'll end up with bunions, hammer toes, claw toes, all that fun stuff. And a lot of people don't realize that if you squish your foot into something, it doesn't keep it small. It actually makes it bigger over time. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. What advice would you have for the ladies who like to wear a lot of the heels, maybe the three, four, even five inch heels, you know, over many, many years, what does that do to the foot and to the back? Yeah, over time, actually, it does a lot of damage. So you generally, a lot of women are more prone to bunions because of what we put on our feet. Um, so that pointed toe or the excess pressure on the ball of the foot will just flatten it over time. So your foot will get wider, you'll get bunions, hammer toes. And then if you think about it, if you wear a high heel all day, that just shortens your Achilles. So a lot of women, when they are retiring from wearing high heels or they can't wear them anymore, uh, lack that range of motion. And it's really hard to go back down to a runner. Um, it takes a lot of work. And sometimes we still have to put a heel lift into the shoe because they're just too tight at that point. Now, if people do actually want to go running or jogging, what should they look for in a good running shoe? There's so many different shoes on the market. I guess it really depends kind of what kind of heel striker or midfoot or forefoot striker you want to be. So um, if you strike in the heel, obviously that puts a little bit more pressure onto the knee. So if you're someone who struggles with knee pain, I would suggest going with a lower drop heel to do more of a midfoot strike. Um, again, you're just going to, it's just, it's preference for people who are running. So um there's lots of really cushion ones where it promotes more of a heel strike and then, yeah, more midfoot striker. So I guess it's preference because there's a lot of different options for running that you can do. Emily, let's talk a bit about compression stockings. What are they and what are their true benefits? Now, compression stockings are actually fairly beneficial for the majority of the population. Um, if you have no issue getting blood flow down, I would say you could probably get away with wearing them daily. Um, over time, the body just has a hard time um, getting the blood back up to your heart. The blood doesn't get up just magically. It actually gets up by the calf contracting. So if you have a sitting job or you're standing for long periods of time, there's potential that the blood just pools over over time. So if you think about your veins, they are like a backflow valve. Every time your calf contracts, the veins open and then they close. So when you have excess pressure down and then the next level pressure, they get leaky. And that's how you can kind of develop with uh, varicose veins, um, just some swelling, like edema, that kind of stuff over time. So they are beneficial for the majority of the public especially women who tend to have a little bit more strain from pregnancies and, and issues like that. But definitely flying, for sure. I would recommend flying with compression socks for pretty much everybody. So apart from compression stockings, does it make a difference what type of socks a person may wear? Um, not necessarily. I guess we do sweat a lot more with our hands and our feet. But um, it's, again, generally on preference. Um, Natural fibers generally work a lot better for sweat. So if you're wearing something that's a little bit more natural, like merino wool or cotton, it generally is a little bit less sweaty. But again, that's a preference thing. If you're suffering from like athlete's foot or something like that, it's definitely you want to keep it dry is kind of the process on that one. I believe you also use ankle and wrist braces at your clinic. What are those used for specifically? Yeah, so it just depends kind of what um, type of injuries that someone's coming in with. Like I do a lot of wrist bracing for carpal tunnel at night. So a lot of carpal tunnel bracing, um, ankle braces, a lot of athletes for reoccurring um, ankle sprains. Um, so it just generally depends kind of what's walking through those doors or hobbling, I guess, in some cases. But yeah. So any final advice on the best care for our feet? I'm thinking maybe at the end of the day, give yourself a nice foot massage to get the blood flowing, flowing properly because we have a lot of nerve endings at the end of our feet, correct? We do, yeah. And that's why I find reflexology is a good practice as well. Like, and, and you know, maybe you can convince that special someone at home to give you a foot massage if they, <laughs> if they will. <laughs> uh, if they will. But yeah, 
rolling a ball under your foot at the end of the day can definitely help loosen all of that uh, walking that you've done because your feet are important and it's unfortunate when they do start to hurt, you don't realize how annoying it is when they do. Absolutely. Emily Soper is a certified pedorthist and owner of Nexus Orthotics. Thanks so much for joining us today from Medicine Hat, Alberta. Thank you so much for having me. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.